We have a one-hour newsmaker show today. In this half hour, it's going to be Assemblyman uh, Phil Palmasano coming up at 8.30. Uh, Democrat State Senate candidate Leslie Danks Burke. Uh, first off, welcoming Assemblyman uh, Phil Palmasano to our phones. Hey, Brian. How are you? Doing, uh, doing well, Assemblyman, and yourself? Not too bad. Thank you very much. Uh, Assemblyman, starting off with uh, the COVID-19 situation, um, guessing that you're in uh, contact with uh, Mayor Buckley, the Department of Health uh, in Steuben County, maybe even the State Department of Health. Uh, what do we know there? Well, Brian, uh, certainly the issue with COVID-19 is, is something that has all of our attention, uh, certainly with the concern with the, what's going on with Hornell Gardens and the uh, with the testing they went through on there recently, the mass testing where they, you know, found a majority of those cases with the in, with the residents and staff that had tested positive. That's certainly a big, big concern. Something we're continuing to monitor closely. Uh, we know the Department of Health has 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 been engaged, uh, and as far as putting together uh, a mitigation or action plan, I think the concern I have and others have too, is as far as that putting that plan together, is a uh, the county of Steuben was not, and emergency management was not involved with discussions with, with the state and uh, the, the nursing home relative to how that was going to work out. I think that's a, a big mistake. That doesn't work. Uh, that doesn't show working together. Uh, they needed. I think they needed to be a part of those discussions. It really doesn't make sense to me why they were not. I've conveyed those my thoughts on that uh, to to the executive on that as well and. Uh, but obviously, there's at least I know the Department of Health is engaged, is involved. I think really just from that perspective, I, I wish the county would have been more engaged in it or been allowed to be more part of those discussions. You know, so but it's certainly something that's uh, got all our attention uh, relative to what's happening there and how the, you know how how that mitigation and action plan is going to work out and, and moving forward. I think that needs to be discussed so people are aware of it. Um, it's definitely uh, something that we need to be paying close attention to because there's other nursing homes that have had uh, residents test positive and also staff. And as there seems to be a, a, a trend that's going on across the state. Uh, I know there's even been calls for more transparency with our nursing homes. I know uh, Congressman Stefanicic uh, uh, has, has, has proposed that and has talked about that as well uh, for more disclosure what's what's happening with our nursing homes. I think uh, uh, and our counties, I think, are, are speaking out and trying to keep people aware of that, and I think it's a good thing. So that's something we have to continue to look at and monitor closely, and hopefully uh, the proper precautions are taken, being taken and actions are being taken so uh, we can keep our residents and our staff safe. Speaking with Assemblyman Phil Palmasano, you were a big part of... Um that uh, movement led by Congressman Tom Reed to oppose uh, Governor Andrew Cuomo uh, on the uh, ventilator issue of uh, getting the ventilators from uh, upstate uh, nursing homes. It seems that the uh, governor uh, backed away from that idea, Assemblyman Palmasano. Well, yeah, I think uh, the way this all came about, uh, I think it was a week ago Friday, um, where uh, the governor in the morning in his press briefing had said that he was going to, if he come have this National Guard takes uh, unused ventilators throughout that whole day, the way that that whole event transpired is it started out with that press conference where he indicated that I know Tom Reed, myself, Tom Mayor, and others were on the phone, and then Tom organized a, a conference uh, or delegation in the region uh, about you know making everyone sure we we're, were aware of, and we all kind of spoke out in one voice. And how that transpired throughout the day was first it was unused ventilators, and then there was a message to the hospital uh, directors that it was 10%. And then uh, two hours later, in a press statement by uh, the governor's press person, said 20%. And so we had a statement that went out right away to kind of criticize that approach. And, and listen, it was never about upstate not trying to be helpful to downstate. Uh, but you don't, uh, asking us to be helpful is one thing. But Saying we're going to send the National Guard out. That doesn't talk about working together. That kind of speaks to the military state. And that certainly rubbed and concerned a lot of people, a lot of residents who heard it, concerned the, the, the representatives in the region and across the state. I mean, it wasn't just even through this whole process, too, when this all happened, it wasn't just our delegation in our region, but there were uh, people in Buffalo and Rochester and other parts of upstate New York that spoke out. And again, it's not that we wouldn't want to help or participate, 
and try to provide assistance where we could. But you don't come up and just say, we're going to take all your your ventilators, uh, uh, even 20%. You have to have some more clarification, and they have clarified all that. You know, the executive order that came out with the wording was is, is spoke more of a voluntary participation, didn't use a, a, a necessarily a threshold that they had to partic- give up any of your uh, ventilators. I think it's talking more about if you're not using them, if you don't need them, if you don't foresee that you need them. Uh, it's, and it's basically uh, voluntary. And where our concern came in, too, is where initially they were talking about 20%. Was it going to be 20 This whole conversation kind of went through the whole weekend through communications I had with the, the executive uh, office through different con- conversations, phone calls, emails. You know, 20% per facility or 20% across the state of New York. And, again, this is all kind of changed as we went along. I, you know, I'm glad that has happened. Um, it's 20% per facility for a number, couple of, some of my facilities only have five ventilators. So you're going to have to give up one or if one of them has 10, two. I mean, and, and the argument, too, on this against this, Brian, too, is, yeah, yes, you might not need a ventilator right now. Someone in your, in your hospital might come in the hospital and might not have a need for a ventilator right this minute, right now, as they kept saying. But that doesn't mean you would need a ventilator tomorrow or even six or 12 hours from now. Uh, we saw in the case in, 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 in the Hornell area, I believe there's like four people intubated within a 12-hour period. I gave the example of someone I know who was on a ventil- who came into hospital, wasn't feeling well, did okay at first, wasn't on the ventilator. About six hours later, they took a downturn for the worst, then they had to be on a ventilator. In a situation like this, this there could have been a situation where there might, there might not have been enough ventilators if they took some or forced them to be taken away, that that individual would have been have a ventilator. So that's where our concern came from as a delegation. You know, you can't, it's not that we don't want to help. Of course, upstate's going to want to help. We want to help. We're going to say we want to help out. But you can't leave our facilities with no resources, no ventilators, no PPE for our employees who are on the front lines of this. I mean, it was a whole point of this. But, yes, uh, the, the governor, you know, to his credit, has kind of at least walked back what he said from the get-go. That's what stirred up the hornet's nest when you say you're going to send the National Guard out to come take the unused ventilators that are not being used right now. That's that. That's what stirred us up. But I'm glad that they walked that back. It's now a voluntary act that the hospitals are making on a case by case basis, uh, and, and within within the entire whole upstate system. So it doesn't, and thank goodness things have apparently changed. I don't. I'm not an expert. I don't have all the official documentation, but it does sound like things have changed and there's not a need for that. I even saw the Governor Cuomo return 30 back to an upstate nursing home that had had volunteered them. So hopefully we're on the, on the right side of that. So the numbers that we're seeing coming in as far as the curve, I, you know, again, I'm not the medical expert. I just know from what I see in the report. So hopefully we're on the right side of that. But, yes, I was glad to be part of the, that effort with Congressman Reed, Senator O'Mara, Tomlin Burns, uh, Joe Giglio, Senator Borrello, uh, in our region, certainly all of us who are very much engaged in those discussions, and I, and I want to give Congressman Reed a great deal of credit too. He is constantly uh, communicating with the, the state delegation, and so you know we're coordinating efforts, making us aware of what's going on at the federal level, and so we can have a back and forth dialogue. So he's certainly been a great uh, representative and great leader on this in this front really from the get go. Speaking with Assemblyman Phil Pomasano, I want to get to budget issues because the budget is kind of. Uh... Uh, been unnoticed with all the news on COVID-19. I did want to ask you a couple of questions there. Before we do that, I wanted to ask you, Assemblyman, a uh, story this morning on uh, NewYorkStateOfPolitics.com. That's a Spectrum News website. And Nick uh, Reisman reports that uh, criminal justice and prison inmates groups yesterday urged Governor Andrew Cuomo to release what they describe as vulnerable inmates from state prisons after a third person died behind uh, bars from the coronavirus. And uh, the groups uh, put out a statement saying that it's just a matter of time before many of these prisoners uh, die behind bars uh, with COVID-19. Did you have any thoughts there, Assemblyman Palmasano? I didn't see the statement. I know there's been some push to try to release some prisoners, but I mean, I think you have to, you have to take that into consideration of which inmates are talking about, for, 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 for God's sakes. I mean, you don't want to be putting violent uh, criminals out on the street and release them just because you're concerned about the, the, uh, them contracting COVID-19 or coronavirus. I mean, 
the, I think the administration could have done a much better job on this from the front get go if they would have been quicker to certainly ban um, um, visitation at our correctional facilities, um, slow down on the transportation of uh, inmates from facility to facility, which they, it took them a long time to act on. I mean, it took several, you know, I had several phone calls to the Department of Corrections and the executive on that uh, email saying that they needed to get rid of the ban the visitors from visitation from coming in in, in, the, in the transportation and it would certainly be helpful if we make sure you know, it took a while for the administration to, to basically say corrections officers could wear masks in the in the facilities, and now they they're allowed to wear their masks, but they're still not getting provided full PPE. Uh, you know, and obviously they're having a lot of interaction with inmates and patients, uh, inmates uh, in within the facilities, not patients, but in their, their re- they were restricted use of uh, the PPE they're getting. So, and there's certainly a, grow- a growing number of. Uh, corrections officers that continue to um, get that within their facilities. They haven't released, they haven't been really too transparent, uh, the state as, you know, how many, you know, corrections officers are coming down with it and where they are. I think, I think we use, certainly use a little bit more transparency there. I know, I think, I think on the federal side or local side they're doing that, but they're not doing that uh, at the state side. But really, uh, if the administration would take some actions quicker, uh, especially when it came to our prisons and our correctional facilities, that would have helped the situation. They waited too long, in my opinion, to stop inmate visitations from outside because it was coming in from the outside. Uh, they'd waited too long to stop with the transportation, you know, which really makes no sense from transferring inmates from one facility to another facility. And same thing, this whole, this whole prison closure thing, which is part of the budget, and I brought this up during the debate too, Brian, why, what sense does it make to close down a correctional facility within 90, 90 days after 90 days notification taking a group of inmates who are in one facility uh, center there and then spreading them out to facilities all across the state same thing with employees it really makes no sense but that we can get into the budget issue as well on that later um, but yes I mean you certainly, you certainly have to evaluate if you're just we can't just release inmates for the sake of releasing them uh, that doesn't mean that they're going to be any safer if they get outside and it's certainly you know, if you what's going on we need to look at it but especially if they're dangerous or a threat to the public outside as well we have to watch all that and it all needs to be taken into account i certainly hope it is whatever decisions the administration is making and releasing inmates in our facilities we can't release dangerous inmates back out into the street uh which would put everyone in jeopardy from that perspective as well speaking with assemblyman phil palmasala we're going to talk about the budget as soon as we get back stay with us we'll be with you in another uh, 60 seconds stay there maple city savings wants the hornell area to know they are here to assist you with your banking needs even in these uncertain times their atms are available 24 7 for withdrawals and deposits their drive-ups remain open for deposits withdrawals and loan payments during normal hours over the phone they can assist with any issues related to purchases online transactions loan payment transfers and debit card processing questions phone 607-324-1822 with online banking at maplecitysavings.com they offer commercial ACH ACH transfers bill pay e-statements mobile and merchant deposits and so much more they even offer online deposit account openings for existing and new customers also online, you'll be able to complete a mortgage application or request a pre-qualification so you can shop for your new home. They've been serving the local community since 1906 and are here to stay. Maple City Savings Bank, FDIC insured, and an equal housing lender. Back with Assemblyman Phil Pomisano, as we said in segment one, uh, the budget's something that has not gotten a whole lot of attention lately, uh, obviously because of uh, COVID-19. Assemblyman Pomisano, the budget went through. Uh, what was in it that you'd like to tell us about? Well, yes, Brian, certainly the, the, the COVID-19 and the coronavirus situation has certainly impacted our state budget. It's certainly taken all the attention away from what was in the budget, what wasn't in the budget, and it certainly has infected our, 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 impacted our whole budget process. Uh, before it started, you know, we were, we were, at, uh, about, we were looking at about uh, a, a $6 billion budget deficit. Uh, with the changes and the, the, the damage that's been done to our economy, we're, we're, we're looking at a 10 to 15 plus billion dollar budget deficit. Now the governor has authority that he can make mid-year changes, which could, you know, pose even additional problems. But we did put a budget in place. I have some uh, strong concerns. I've been, I was critical of the budget for a couple of reasons. First of all, it was it was something we cautioned about even before is not to 
include in the budget these unnecessary, controversial, policy-laden proposals. So a number of policy-laden proposals were stuck in this budget, and not, not to mention a number of misguided priorities when it comes to the budget itself. Uh, some of the uh, misplaced, uh, some of the b- policy issues, Brian. Uh, let's talk. Start with the uh, new uh, renewable sitting um, uh, bill, uh, language, which is as far as citing solar solar panels and solar solar farms and wind farms, which will basically be all across upstate New York and will put the authority uh, on the hands of the state, New York State, without any uh, impact input from local governments. There's no local control, no local authority, and, and this can be put in place without with any regard to the local laws that are on the books as far as setbacks or height. Uh, that can be taken into consideration, but the state of New York will have the sole authority to put the, these windmills and these solar farms uh, anywhere they want uh, without that local input. I think that's uh, very, very concerning. I think also concerning with that regard, too, is taking away authority from the local IDA to negotiate pilots uh, that authority was, you know, our ideas negotiate the pilot agreements to make sure our school districts, our towns, our counties are protected to make sure they get needed revenue. Um, put that, hand, that that authority or that the veto approved authority in that on that to NYSERDA, which has no care whatsoever for our local communities. All they care about is getting up as many windmills and solar panels as, as much renewable energy as possible, um, so they can meet the, the mandates of the. Uh, so-called Clean New Green New Deal plan from New York, the CCLPA, as they refer to it, that was passed last year, which is just a, a mandate that's going to be, in my opinion, devastating to New York. It will not accomplish the goals they need to make altogether. When you think New York only contributes 0.5% of the total global carbon emissions and only 3%, 3.3% of the total emissions in the country, uh, you're not going to make the impact you need uh, with that plan. And now they're going to fast-track all these uh, these solar and solar and wind projects all across upstate New York without any local input, I think, was, is an affront and a very dangerous pre- precedent. Assemblyman, uh, so what you're saying is NYSERDA is going to decide how many wind turbines there are, uh, how big they'll be, and where they're going to go in each individual town? Not NYSERDA. NYSERDA Empire State Development will be okay. the ones in charge of the program. NYSERDA will have, uh, and they will decide where they go and, um, and without... It, Without regard, there's no there's no local members on a sitting board. On Article 10, at least you have local members on a sitting board who have some voice and some input and say what's going on. Economic Devel- Empire State Development, there's no local sitting board anymore. Basically, they're going to make the decision. And it doesn't matter if the local community doesn't want it. It doesn't matter if the local community has local rules or ordinances opposing it. Uh, they, they, don't, they can ignore them if they feel they're too onerous to the development. So they, they have all authority, Empire State Development. Where NYSERDA comes into play is basically when you're talking about the pilot agreements, which usually is done um, for the for the tax revenue, for the money that comes in, you know, when there's a development. And they, uh, the IDA would usually negotiate those pilot agreements. They do that on other uh, projects that come into communities and negotiate pilot agreements. So how much money is going to go to the school district? How much money is going to go to the county or town? Now NYSERDA is going to have more authority over that. So And let's face facts, and I said this on the floor, NYSERDA doesn't care one iota about uh, a, a school district in Steuben County or a town or county in Steuben County. All they care about is getting up all these uh, renewable, get more renewable energy pilot projects online, more wind and solar so they can meet this ridiculous mandate that the governor has, has in the legislature passed last year um, to say that uh, we're going to be basically 100% carbon free by 2040, which is just, I think, uh, yeah, I'm not saying we, and I've never said we shouldn't do anything about the climate change, but we can't certainly can't do it all on our own. And what this bill that we pass is is just New York going alone. It doesn't affect China, Brazil, or Russia. It doesn't affect Pennsylvania, uh, Ohio, or North Carolina. All you can do is see our businesses, our manufacturers, our farms leaving our state and going to these other states that don't have these restrictive regulations. Um, I know the governor always says we're going to lead and we're going to make other people fall. No, you're not. The only thing that's going to happen is we're going to continue to see more and more people leaving our state. We've already lost over a million people since the governor took office. We're going to drive our farmers out of, out of the business. We're going to drive our manufacturing out of the business. And they're already struggling. This is just going to be, you know, with everything going on now and trying to rebuild from this, this is just going to be compound that fact. And I think this renewable sitting law is probably one of the uh, one of the worst policy things that we put in the budget. And to take away that local input, that local control, that local authority is, is just wrong, in my opinion. It shouldn't have happened. Down to the last three minutes with Assemblyman Phil Pomisano. Anything else in the budget uh, you wanted to uh, tell us about? 
Yeah, I think uh, if you look at the financial side, I mean, first of all, the governor, you know, proposed and the legislature pushed forward with a, a, a very misguided plan. Now you're going to have a, even when the courts threw it out, a hundred, a hundred million plus year a taxpayer co- campaign funded system. I mean, what are we thinking about when our businesses are being crushed? A hundred million dollar tax taxpayer campaign funded system. Uh, so your tax dollars are now going to go fund uh, political commercials and yard signs for for candidates you might vehemently disagree with. I mean, our system wasn't wasn't perfect, Brian. It certainly needed improvement, but the one thing about it was voluntary. Now everyone's going to be participating with their tax dollars. How about a four hundred twenty million dollar uh, film tax credit for Hollywood and the entertainment industry? Uh, why are we making subsidies to these this industry? I have no idea. When our small businesses are being crushed. Uh, by the closures, by the lost revenue, by the lost investment, by the lost employees. Uh, there's $520 million right there that would be better used for our, helping our small businesses um, tr- to help them now, to help them recover. Uh, that's just misplaced guy priorities. We shouldn't be helping, uh, you know, we should be helping Main Street, not Rodeo Drive or Hollywood Boulevard. We should be helping our small businesses on Main Street that need the help right now, not subsidizing the Hollywood and film tax credit. I mean, like Saturday Night Live has benefited from this. I like the show, but they should have never received taxpayer funds to, to, to get money to, to, to for their show. I mean, are we concerned? I brought this up. Are we concerned they're going to be leaving the state? It's called, they start off the show live from New York, Saturday Night Live. It's not live from Saskatchewan, not live from Portland, not live from Philadelphia. It's live from New York. So why are we giving them any taxpayer funds whatsoever? That money would be better used to provide uh, assistance to our small businesses. And, and when we had a chance to do that, we put our small business uh, recovery plan up as an amendment, which would have provided some immediate relief to our small businesses, would have re- redirected some of these tax credits, these misguided tax credits like the Hollywood or film tax credit uh, and to, to our small businesses. But yet, here we are, taxpayers are on the hook to help fund the entertainment industry. That doesn't make any sense to me. And uh, so it's just really frustrating to me when I see some of these things, and certainly the governor and the legislative majority put more pork in the budget for them to do capital projects, but not yet not increase our chips funding. And we did restore the winter recovery money for our local local communities, which was a plus from my perspective. And I think that's a positive thing. You know, they were able to restore that money, but the governor still has approval to make changes throughout the budget. We just kind of continue to watch that, um, and certainly the prison closures I think is another misguided policy. The governor t- likes to take credit for the prisons he's closed, but he doesn't want to take credit. He needs to, if he's going to do that, Brian, uh, he needs to take credit for the, the, the increased violence that, that this we have continued to see going on in our prisons by jamming more and more prisoners into fewer facilities. Uh, has not yet got rid of the double bunks and double cells. So it's a dangerous and inhumane practice, which leads to more violence in our facilities. He hasn't done enough on the drugs into our facilities, which we know come in through inmate visitations and through the mail. Um, why not put a drug dog at every correctional facility? Why not put, put a secure vendor pet program in place to get the packages that are getting drugs in? That's how the drugs get in. We're not doing enough to stop that. All those things with the uh, double bonking and the closures have led to a dramatic increase in spike. Assemblyman, I'm sorry to cut you off, but we do have to leave it there to join uh, Fox News. I want to thank you so much for coming on, Assemblyman Palmasano. Thanks, Frank. Thank you so much for uh, joining us this morning. Leslie Danksburg coming up next here on WLEA.